Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere on the internet today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. We're going to do our best to both educate and inspire you for the next little while. On tap today, a big, big, big show, because while millions were celebrating a record-setting performance at the annual 4th of July hot dog eating competition, well, the competitors now are facing a grim reality of the toll that the Gorge Fest has taken on their health. And Dr. Neil Barnard is here with a look at what all of the fat and the calories and the cholesterol from eating 75 hot dogs in just 10 minutes, what all of that can add up to. Dr. Barnard, can't wait to hear these stats with you. Frightening stuff. And oh my goodness gracious, how's life has changed since the beginning of the pandemic. We are going to be looking at some of the healthier habits that we've established and how you can keep them going as we settle into this new normal when we're joined by dietitian Maggie Neola. Maggie, can't wait to hear from you today. Looking forward to it. <laughs> and plus, we are going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So if you have a question for Dr. Barnard, go ahead and add that to the comment section right now. We will be choosing one to answer on the show in just a little bit. But first, let's get you caught up with what is going on in the world. Here are your health headlines for Monday, July 6th. 2020. The rolling seven-day average for new coronavirus cases in the U.S. set another record Sunday, marking the 27th consecutive day that it did so. Health officials announcing more than 43,000 fresh cases nationwide, as 12 states also set their own records yesterday, according to the Washington Post. Meanwhile, coronavirus tracking by Johns Hopkins reveals more than three dozen states continue to trend upward. Former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb tells the CBS, quote, we're right back where we were at the peak of the pandemic during the New York outbreak. And the sustained surge in cases is also continuing to stretch the limits of medical systems as coronavirus-related hospitalizations reach their highest levels to to date in both Arizona and Nevada. And in Texas, the mayors of Austin and Houston are warning that hospitals will be in serious trouble soon if caseloads don't begin to subside. Overall, meanwhile, the U.S. is closing in on 2.9 million total infections since the beginning of the pandemic, with 130,000 people having died, though health experts believe both numbers represent just a fraction of what the true toll actually is. In other news, our good friends at Smithfield Foods are on a mission to give out 1 million hot dogs to frontline workers in the Los Angeles area. But as Veg News was kind enough to point out, their act of generosity comes as meat processing plants remain hotbeds for COVID-19 related activity. Tens of thousands of workers at these facilities have tested positive for the virus, with some plants being forced to shut down due to widespread outbreaks. And then there is the fact that hot dogs and processed meats are considered cancer-causing class 1 carcinogens by the World Health Organization. If it's the thought that counts, they may want to think again. Okay, let's turn our attention now back to Saturday. It was there in New York that the world's best competitive eaters gathered for a race to see who could eat the most hot dogs in 10 minutes. And this year did look a little bit different. The gluttons were separated by plexiglass in an effort to stay healthy during the pandemic. But ironically, there was nothing healthy about what was going on. I want to welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the exam room for the first time this week to talk about this. And Dr. Barnard, last week, Dr. Vanita Rahman and I, we were talking about the hot dog eating contest as well. And I mean, just really, wow. This year, let, let me give you the, the totals here, Dr. Barnard. This year, Joey Chestnut, the man that they call Jaws, he was the winner. He beat his previous record by scarfing down 75 hot dogs and buns in those 10 minutes. And while millions were celebrating this victory, just take a look at the gargantuan sum of fat and calories he just ingested. You see this right there on your screen. I mean, we're talking about 22,000 200 calories. And by the way, this is one hot dog shy of his record. So, I mean, you're looking at that, you, you've got what, 1300 plus grams of fat, 444 grams of saturated fat, cholesterol, tens of thousands of grams, and the sodium, my goodness gracious, 2388% of the sodium you need in a single day. 
I mean, Dr. Barnard, so we see these numbers and we see what Joey Chestnut did to his body here. And you just got to think, I mean, short term, he's just not feeling all that great today. I can't imagine that he would be. Uh, that's right. Um, you mentioned earlier about Smithfield donating uh, products and then about the, these hot dog eating contests. It's important to recognize that although one is, um, is described as a philanthropic act and the other is described as sort of a sporting event in quotes, uh, the truth is they're both promotional activities. They're both marketing activities to try to make people think of a hot dog in a, a sort of uh, Americana. But it's about as Americana as colorectal cancer. And let me walk you through some of the, the stats on that. Um, all processed meats, hot dogs, of course, but also deli slices, ham, sausage, uh, they're all linked to colorectal cancer. Now, the good news is that overall, if you look year after year, colorectal cancer rates are going down. Uh, this is uh, for women. This is for men. Um, and so if you looking out back over the past, oh, since about 1999, they've been going, uh, going down fairly steadily. But there's a couple of things about this that are actually a real big problem. First of all, you see that red line up at the top. That's black Americans. And whether we're looking at women in this slide or men in this slide, you can see there's this huge racial disparity uh, where blacks are, are uh, contracting and dying of colorectal cancer in enormous numbers. The other problem is that among young people, we're seeing colorectal cancer increasing. So for the overall population, it's going down. We're, we're tackling cancer. There are more colonoscopies, all to the good. With young people, it's exactly the opposite uh, because uh, eating bacon is a fad and a hot dog contest looks like fun. So let's get some. It's the 4th of July. Let's put some weenies on the grill, da, 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 da. And it's not just colorectal cancer. It's pancreatic cancer, kidney cancer, uterine cancer, and gallbladder cancer, and multiple myeloma. All these are increasing in young People And by young, I mean anybody up to the age of 49. It's getting worse. Okay. Well, uh, colorectal cancer is, uh, I'm putting that at the top of the list because it's the third leading cancer killer and hot dogs cause it. So these foods, the sausages, the hot dogs, the bacon, those are big, big drivers of this. And I don't need to remind you, it's been five years since the World Health Organization basically came out and said, don't eat this stuff. Every 50 gram portion of processed meats, that's hot dogs, sausage, bacon, ham, deli slices, every 50 gram portion increases the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. So what do you mean? One portion, 18%, what does that matter? Well, a person has bacon for breakfast. That's one portion. For lunch, maybe they stop by the 7-Eleven and they get a hot dog or two hot dogs. They're now up to three portions. And for dinner, if they have a pepperoni pizza, the pepperoni, that's processed meat. They've had four portions. Every portion increases your risk by 18%. So multiply 18% by four. Okay, I've just increased my risk by 72% if that's my daily routine. Now, the truth is most people have different routines and they may eat more of this one day and less another day. But overall, this is a huge driver of colorectal cancer risk. Um, this is a map of Washington, D.C., and this is colorectal cancer, that arrow there, that's in ward three, uh, that's where I am right now. And that R is the rate per 100,000 people, 22 people per, per 100,000 population are diagnosed with this in 2019, again, 2020, and it'll be the same in 2021. Down here at the bottom, uh, you have ward eight, that's a more economically disadvantaged part of town. And the R there, the rate there is not 22 per 100,000, it's 73. It's more than three times higher. What am I saying? I'm saying that conditions related to processed meat take a bigger toll among economically disadvantaged people and particularly the black population. Uh, and it's not just colorectal cancer, it's breast cancer. Uh, every October, everyone puts on pink things and they think about breast cancer, but we should really be thinking about the foods on our plate. Processed meat doesn't just increase colorectal cancer, it increases breast cancer too. Several other forms of the disease. Okay. Um, is this new? Here's a New York Times article. Cancer increasing among meat eaters, particularly among foreign born using foods derived from diseased animals. This was published by the New York Times, September 24th, 19... Oh, seven. In other words, 113 years ago, 
it was clear that meat, eater was, meat eaters were at higher risk for cancer. But it's still a fad, so Smithfield donates it to, to people working in hospitals so that they feel better. And then we have a contest to make everyone feel uh, how fun it is to eat <laughs> processed meat. That's all the bad news. The good news I have is that there are alternatives to all of this now. You can go to any store and not too far away from the actual hot dogs, there, was, there are the veggie dogs. And what you notice, they don't have any nitrates in them. They have no cholesterol. They have no saturated fat. They don't have any animal parts at all. And that is a great way to transition away from the bad stuff. There's veggie bacon, veggie sausage, veggie ham. You may not want to stick with that for the long run as you find healthier foods, but it's a great parachute away from unhealthy processed meat. Back to you, Chuck. Here's the thing that I, I wanted to bring up. You know, hot dogs, they really are the all-American thing, as you put it, as, as all-American as colorectal cancer. But somebody close to me over the weekend uh, f realized, and, and mind you, they've had many, many trips around the sun, uh, that hot dogs, essentially, traditional hot dogs, are made up of meat leftovers, and the casing is intestines. And so I'm wondering if more people actually knew what it was that they were eating would they be making different choices? What do you think? Um, what, what's that old saying? Uh, if you could see how, how sausage and legislation is made, you know, you would recoil. It's really true. And the idea that it's American, um, we might want to take another look at that. Frankfurter. Let's see. Frankfurt, Vermont? Frankfurt, California? <laughs> Frankfurt. <laughs> there may be one in Kentucky, but uh, we, we, this is an old European uh, dish and from other places as well, and it's uh, cheap junk and, and and it was it was invented before people had thoughts about the welfare of animals, before they thought about the environment, and before a scientist had connected it to colorectal cancer. It's time to take processed meats, throw them out, and that's a good step for all the rest of the meats too. Yeah, as you oh, said, I, the uh... one thing very important. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to, to mention. Some people will think, okay, if it's a turkey hot dog or chicken sausage, is that healthier? The answer is no, it's still processed meat. And according to the World Health Organization, it still causes cancer. Good to know. All right, and as you said, there are plenty of veggie alternatives. Joey Chestnut uh, ingesting what more than 2,600 milligrams of, of <laughs> sodium there uh, on Saturday. So the veggie hot dogs, if he still would have eaten 75 of them, none of that would have been there. So, uh, all right, Dr. Barnard, uh, let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag here. And today's question is a really interesting one. And it's something that I think that maybe a lot of people kind of struggle with just out of the blue. They come these cravings from foods that they've had many, many moons ago. Uh, this is from a, uh, a woman who writes, I've been plant-based for the past two years, but lately... I've been craving eggs. I just had blood work and everything came back at normal levels, but what is my body missing that's making me crave eggs? Ah, uh, do you have a cholesterol deficiency? Uh, <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding, there's no such thing. Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, that's not a very common, uh, common thing. The big thing that we find people craving is cheese and then when they break free from that, they're really glad. But it, it can happen. Uh, First of all, why, why would one want to resist that craving? Um, eggs really do have cholesterol in them, but they have more cholesterol than any other food. And the cholesterol that you eat does add to your own. Uh, so that's not good. They also have a substantial amount of saturated fat. Two eggs that you might fry for breakfast, that gives you about 3.2, something like that, grams of saturated fat. You don't need that either. Uh, what can you do instead? If you're looking for a high protein food, if that's the reason that the eggs are call, calling, it, calling out to you, think about this. Egg white has almost no flavor, but it kind of takes on the, the salt or the baking grease or whatever it's cooked in. Tofu has almost an identical consistency to egg white. So that's why people have taken tofu and they scramble it up. It's very much like scrambled eggs. And to flavor it up, they will add a little bit of nutritional yeast and a little bit of soy sauce uh, sometimes a little ginger, a little bit of garlic, scramble it up in your nonstick pan, and you'll forget about eggs. And there's no cholesterol, virtually no saturated fat. 
All right. If you have a question for Dr. Barnard that we didn't get to today, no worries. We keep each and every one that comes in and we may try to get you an answer on a future show. So go ahead and keep on posting them in the comment section now, or you can tweet them to us at PCRM at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure that you use the hashtag exam room podcast. Dr. Barnard, appreciate your time and your wisdom, my friend. You bet. All right, moving on. For the past four months, our lives have been turned upside down as the coronavirus pandemic has just run rampant across the world. And nowhere has it hit harder than right here in the U.S. And many have strived to make healthier decisions as a result. They want to live healthier lives in an attempt to boost their immune system and, and keep the virus at bay. But will these healthier habits stick? How can we maintain our own personal progress, even as the rush to reopen sends new cases of COVID-19 skyward? Well, with a look at the evolution of our habits and how pressing forward uh, can stick to a healthier future, we welcome dietitian Maggie Neola from the Barnard Medical Center. Maggie, so glad you're here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I mean, four months ago really seems like a lifetime at this point. And now that the new normal has set in, let's uh, go all the way back to March when things really started to pop off. I remember at that time, grocery stores were just a circus. And exactly. that was only the tip of the iceberg. Absolutely. It was hard to find a potato or canned beans. <laughs> there are so many things that were wiped out in the grocery store. I think the funniest one was tofu. I don't know when America started to love tofu, but I, I'm glad to see it. <laughs> I just hope <laughs> actually used it once they bought it. Um, but I, it was actually pretty funny because all of the different beans that people were buying, um, we saw a lot of articles come out, you know, 12 different ways you can use canned beans or dry beans or tofu. And uh, I, I don't know. I'm very curious to hear if people actually use them uh, when they bought them or if they're just been emergency food. Um, but all that to say, we saw people stock up on some healthful foods like that and also some unhealthful things like frozen entrees and more boxed items. And we saw people start to have to make their own meals and not dine out as much. Maybe some carry out still existed um, initially, but mostly people were trying to eat from home and, and they didn't have as much fresh produce. Um, so that initial curve was that we weren't making the healthiest food choices. Um, and our physical activity went down because gyms closed, our stress levels went really, really high, of course, um, and our budget got a lot tighter, especially with rising unemployment rates. So you can see where that was like initially very, very stressful for many Americans. You know, it's funny, you're talking about the frozen entrees, and I will tell you that one of the positives, though, that I did notice was the trend in plant-based, the sales of plant-based foods, which have really been on a, a nice upward trajectory since the beginning of this. And it's kind of sustained, even though this uh, meat shortage, you know, that everyone was worried about has kind of subsided a little bit as well. So that's a positive that I think that we can walk away with. Absolutely. We definitely saw people shift towards eating more plant-based foods um, and learning how to make those and realizing that they're pretty simple and really cost effective. So even though initially there was all this stress, I think what we've innovated with has been really impressive. Um, I know in the beginning there was a lot of information sharing from different organizations on how to prepare meals, um, how to manage stress. We saw a lot of free exercise videos and meditation videos online. Uh, restaurants were donating foods, especially to school-aged children. We saw a lot of school meal pickup sites, which are still running throughout the summer, which is awesome. A shout out to our school lunch heroes. Um, and we also saw that we could buy snap foods online. So a lot of things have changed and innovated out of a time of stress, which I think is very characteristic of stress where we can force us to adapt and make changes. And now that it's been three months, uh, some of the helpful habits I've seen, not just with my patients, but reading them online, is we've seen a lot of people get more involved in gardening, getting a CSA from local farms, um, learning how to cook, uh, eating as a family, which you know sometimes wouldn't happen before because we didn't have time. So now that we have more time, some of us, not necessarily everybody, we've taken more time to self-reflect, develop new routines, get more sleep, maybe volunteer somewhere, um, so we're, we're seeing that the way we spend our time is different. Um, the way that we think about it is different. We're trying to build close relationships with the people that we can have, you know, can see, um, whether it's virtual or in person. 
maybe it's the people we live with. Um, and then I think also what's been encouraging is to see that um, sprout of compassion come up where we, we start to realize like we're all struggling together and we can have compassion with one another um, and really help each other out one day at a time since we don't know what the future holds, but we're, we're really focused more on what can we do together today? How can we support each other? As a dietitian, would you say that by and large, cooking at home is healthier than eating out and ergo just by default, because more of us are in fact eating at home now, we're eating healthier? Yeah, more often than not, making food on your own is generally going to be healthier because we just don't use as much oil and salt and sugar that restaurants commonly do. Now, there are definitely plenty of restaurants out there that practice you know, healthful cooking um, and don't do as much of that. But, but by far and large, we do see uh, more salt, sodium and fat coming from restaurant meals and portion size. So typically, if you were to make uh, a meal for yourself, you probably wouldn't serve it on a big plate <laughs> and um, eat as much of it because you'd be portioning out yourself. Whereas a restaurant gives you that portion, they've decided how much you're going to get um, and so it's a little bit harder to say like, okay, I'm only going to eat half because I normally don't eat this much food, food to begin with. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think that eating out less, um, has been a huge benefit for a lot of people's waistlines. Yeah. And, and I mean, really the portions can be just so out of control. I remember that was one of the big things that I had to really kind of work around when I really made up my mind like i'm not going back was asking for that box like right up front so i could just put half of the meal in it before i even began and that way you take that whole out of sight out of mind approach and that's something that i will employ even to this day so uh you know that that's my tip there but you know what i can't let you go also without asking about this hot dog eating contest as well i mean you are a dietitian so i mean this is this is right in your wheelhouse we see uh i don't know if our Director Emily can pull up these numbers again. I have them up on my screen here. Look at this. 22,000 calories and change. I mean, fat through the roof, cholesterol, sodium, all through the roof. When you see these numbers as a dietitian, Maggie, what is your reaction? Uh, shock, surprise, <laughs> alarm, like all of the things. I'm, I'm hoping he's still alive today. Like all of those things are very worrisome to me. Um, I know when you had it pulled up earlier, my jaw just dropped like, Wow, and, and and it's not smart as a dietitian at all to react to what someone's eating, but this is like an exception. <laughs> like, so um, I would be highly concerned and, and I realize he probably feels like mucho, you know, it, it got all these foods in, but like, how do you chew that fast? Like 74 hot dogs in 10 minutes, that requires like you to eat seven to 10 hot dogs, like in a minute, like that's mm. not helpful. It's not mindful eating. We we need to chew slowly and thoroughly and savor our food. And that is not appreciating your food. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, not to condemn or anything. It's just a matter of I'm, I'm concerned if this becomes a trend for for anyone to think that, that it's helpful to eat that way when it's it's very harmful for your body. So um, yeah, that's my the, I, I mean, this, this is how these, these guys, they make a living doing this, you know, both men and women make a eating, uh, make a living doing this. It's called major league eating and competitive eating. You know, it's, it's just wow. amazing. Like the hot dog eating contest is, is the biggest one of the year, but you know, they've got all kinds of contests for, you know, uh, wings, uh, pancakes, burgers, you know, basically mm -hmm. you name it, they will eat it. And, but yeah. I've never seen anything quite like a kale eating contest or something like that. <laughs> I um, mean, and, even though that would be healthy to eat a lot of kale, maybe not that much, but um, in one sitting, <laughs> it's a lot of fiber. Um, but <laughs> I think generally speaking, it just shows that we're not appreciating our food. And if you don't have a healthy relationship with your food, that can create disordered eating, emotional eating, like turning to food for stress, all of which are behaviors that don't set us up for success in the long run. So... I, I need to fact check this, but for whatever reason, the sum $40,000 stands out to me as being the purse for the winner. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. like, he does this for a living. Competitive eaters do this for a living. And I would think that long-term your health, your medical bills are going to be far more than that $40,000. So oh, yeah. at the end of the day, you're, you're breaking even and having a rough go of it a little bit later in life and probably the day after it. Cause you got to figure that's one heck of a tummy ache if nothing else. Right. And that's smart of you to think through like, what are the long-term consequences of my actions? And that's going to help you make wiser decisions too. Like, do you really want more of those, you know, ice cream or whatever? Like that's not going to be helpful for in the long run. 
Um, mm -hmm. Anytime we can get over the impulse and short-term decision-making, it helps. <laughs> so. so if Joey Chestnut, the winner, comes in and he's, he's in your office, he's in your exam room, and he's like, Maggie, I need some help. How do you work with a guy who eats 75 hot dogs in 10 minutes? Well, to be honest, like it's a lot, I, I would be very proud of him for coming to see me. I think that that would be a big first step to acknowledge like, Hey, I, I think I want to change. Um, and there's no shame in like coming to get help. Right. I think that it's really important um, for us to admit when like, Hey, I think I could use help. Um, so if anything, you know, when somebody comes and they're not making the healthiest eating choices, like there's no judgment, there's no shame. It's, it's more out of concern and really wanting to hear like, what is he willing to change? Like maybe he'd consider shifting careers. I don't know. <laughs> or um, it'd be really interesting to hear what he'd want to do differently um, and how he could help him do that. And then just being able to shed light on um, healthier options and ways to go. Um, you know, what, what could he do differently to improve his health? So I would welcome that. I think that would be awesome to be able to interact with someone um, at that stage and, and see what we can do to shift and change things. Well, if you are watching this and you're thinking, well, I could use a little help, but I don't eat anywhere close to 75 hot dogs or any hot dogs at all, probably if you're <laughs> watching this, which is great. Uh, nonetheless, Maggie, you can still work with any and everybody. You can really help get somebody to the next level. My personal opinion is we can all do better. Like almost perfection is... I don't want to say unattainable, but you can always, always, always do better and strive to do better. And that's something that you can work with with uh, your patients over at the Barnard Medical Center. So to make an appointment with Maggie, you can visit <laughs> barnardmedical.org or pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500. You see that number on the screen right there. And Maggie, I'm sure that you have really helped walk people through some just enormous transitions uh, food-wise. Yeah, yeah. And I think like one thing that is really important is that it's about progress, not perfection. Like we could always make progress, like you said, and it's much more encouraging to think about where you've improved and how you can continue to do so instead of feeling like you have to have everything correct every day because nobody can exactly. <laughs> so um, progress is way more valuable. And that's that's a great thing to, to work together on. All right. So if you want to make some progress and you live in the great states of California, New York, Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, Kentucky, or Washington, D.C., go ahead and make that appointment today. You see it at barnardmedical.org or 202-527-7500. Maggie, thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. All right. And by the way, we are working on adding additional states. So stay tuned if you're not living in one of those locations. Hopefully very soon, we will be able to get you online as well. Uh, before we wrap things up today, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who helped make June the biggest month in the history of the Exam Room podcast. More people downloaded the show last month than ever before. And for that, we are grateful. But not just because of the numbers, but because it's gratifying to know that more people than ever are learning about the importance of proper nutrition and shying away from eating 75 hot dogs in 10 minutes. They're learning how to lower their risk of cancer and diabetes and heart disease and live longer and healthier lives. And, and that's really the name of the game, isn't it? To be able to have more time to spend with our family and our friends and quality time at that, have that higher quality of life, hopefully, as we grow older. And that is something that the show is able to do. So if you want to get in on the fun and get educated, get inspired, and share this life-changing and potentially even life-saving information, please head over to Apple Podcast and wherever shows are available and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And when you do, please also leave that five-star rating because that helps even more people who perhaps need the information the most, find it. So head over to Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating and do your part to help make the world a healthier place. My thanks to the incredible crew behind the scenes who helped make the exam room live happen. Our producers are Laura Anderson and Donna Steele and our director is Emily Cologne. 
On behalf of Dr. Neil Barnard and dietitian extraordinaire Maggie Neola and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching. Until tomorrow, please remember, take a stand, stay safe, and keep it plant-based.